morning, guys. Can you hear me all right? <laughs> Got a voice issue right now. Um, so I'm introducing Derek Armitage. He's a professor of, um, at the School of Environment, Resources, and Sustainability at the University of Waterloo. He has interdisciplinary training with a PhD in geography and a master's of science in natural resource planning. His primary research interests are governance of social ecological systems, as well as human dimensions of environmental change. He has a number of affiliated projects um, related to these issues. The first is Oceans Canada Partnership. Um, the second is WEBS, which is well-being and ecosystem service bundles for coastal change, um, or coastal systems, excuse me, experiencing rapid change. And then finally, um, with the Oceans Modeling Forum, which is, it brings together modelers, social scientists, fisheries experts, and traditional knowledge holders to improve fisheries management. Um, and he's focusing on herring there. So he has an, he's the author of a number of books and papers, and I want to um, particularly draw your attention to a paper entitled Co-Management and Co-Production of Knowledge, um, which serves as a foundation for the talk that he's going to give today. And I always think it's important as an early career researcher to learn a little bit more about who um, these professors are, who we look up to. And um, so I asked him a little bit about himself, and he said that learning to snorkel was a pivotal thing that influenced his interest um, in getting into research in marine systems, particularly um, among sea urchins and coral reefs off Mombasa, which I didn't get the story on. That sounds awesome. Um, he also plays a decent game of squash. And being an American, I had to actually look that up on YouTube. It's kind of like racquetball, for those that don't know. And he currently owns a rickety old sailboat that he's learning to sail on Lake Huron. And he says it's a work in progress. So please. Uh, Join me in welcoming Derek. Thank you. All right, well, it's great to be here. Uh, thank you, Zach, for the really nice introduction, and, and I do appreciate the opportunity to, talk, to uh, talk today. I do want to thank the organizing committee, of course, and, and especially for taking the last spot. You know, nothing spells fun like waiting for four days as the anxiety builds to get here, and yeah, so I appreciate that. That's great. Um, I do also want to acknowledge, though, from the outset, many amazing research collaborators and, and colleagues, including Pratip Nayak, a close friend, and many graduate students. Uh, and their many contributions are reflected in some of the things I'm going to talk about today and then discuss this morning. So it's been a fantastic week of discussions. Uh, we, we've talked about uh, all sorts of things. And in particular, for me, a lot of the idea of change has really been front and center. Change, of course, in our oceans and coasts and what's happening. Um, and Eric's talk uh, alluded to that, of course, as well. But also in terms of how we can achieve change and how we can try and take our science and, and, and lead us to, to some positive outcomes, hopefully. And, and, of course, a number of sessions have been dealing with this issue as well, which has been great. Now, I think if we're going to use our science to, to navigate these future oceans and coasts that we're looking at, we do have some obligations, I think, to, to sort of reflect a little bit critically on, on well, you know, where we are in terms of some of these governance processes that we're inevitably going to be engaged in, uh, to think about sort of how and what knowledge is being used to, to help us navigate through these different changes, what, uh, whose knowledge is being used, um, and then think about the politics of knowledge. Uh, and those types of things, because how we co-construct and, and co-produce our understandings of these future oceans and coasts really is an important entry point into how we can actually navigate them and, and, and try and govern them. Obviously, there's no one right way to do this. Uh, lots of different pathways, and each of us can think about what's appropriate for us and how we might want to proceed with that. But uh, I think, again, there is value in, in having us sort of reflect on our own uh, roles and, and responsibilities as a research community. Uh, and and uh, where we want to take some of these ideas. And knowledge co-production, which I'll talk about, is one of those ideas. So I guess the, the key message I really want to, to bring today is that uh, this idea of knowledge co-production is really a, an important, if not a crucial, catalyst for how we can uh, govern our future oceans and coasts, and uh, future oceans and coasts that we hopefully actually want and, and, and that are desirable. Now. To make the link between uh, knowledge co-production and governance in our future oceans. Oh, that's the title slide. There we go. 
So to make this link between knowledge co-production and governance and our future oceans, I'm going to start with a very short story of failure. Uh, now, come on, everyone loves a failure story. So just, you know, I know you want failure stories. So I'm going to talk about one of mine. Uh, I have many, but I'm only going to give you one. Maybe after tonight's dinner, we can talk about more failure stories. Um, but in the spirit of adaptive management, uh, you know, we do need to learn from our failures. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to share one of those. I'll then focus a little bit more on governance uh, and some of the lessons learned from cases of more transformative governance from, from around the world and focusing on what some of the ingredients are for governance success. And of course, one of those ingredients is, is, this, is this idea of knowledge co-production. Now, knowledge co-production is not a new idea, uh, it's, but it is increasingly a popular concept. It has obviously very close ties with, with other uh, concepts we're using here, transdisciplinarity, science policy linkages, participatory research approaches, lots of overlap in these things, but knowledge co-production really seems to be entering the mainstream. Uh, it's increasingly required by funders, uh, and uh, I think lots of us are already engaged in knowledge co-production actively or passively, uh, perhaps whether we know it or not. And so I think there's value in, in thinking through those. So that, for those less familiar with the idea of knowledge co-production, I'll unpack it a little bit and then provide some examples from my own experience. For those that are maybe more familiar with the concept, I'll also uh, you know, problematize it a little bit, challenge and think through a few of the assumptions and principles and ideas behind this, uh, this uh, notion of knowledge co-production. It's not a panacea, um, uh, but it is, uh, you know, it helps us think through some of these issues of governance and how we might navigate our future oceans and coasts. And then I'll end with a few questions uh, and thoughts about where we might go as a research community uh, in the context of IMBER. Uh, and I'm hopeful that these issues and questions resonate in particular with early career researchers because this is, of course, very much about our future oceans. Okay, so I thought I would start with this brief story uh, of, of, of failure. It's in quotes. Uh, and one that actually takes me quite far from an ocean. Uh, but it's instructive in the sense that it, it takes us into the realm of governance and into the realm of knowledge. And what happens when we go in with some preconceived ideas uh, and also preconceived research questions as well. So uh, shortly after completing my master's, I, I went to work as a land use planner in Tanzania. Uh, and the, the, the intention here was to help a very small uh, hunting and gathering community, only about 700 people, uh, nomadic hunting and gathering community, uh, try and secure a title to their land base and then help them sort of make some decisions and think through what the implications are for how they can manage this land base. Now, the fundamental challenge was that this group, this hunting and gathering group, was being encroached upon by pastoralists on the one hand and agriculturalists on the other. So it was a really tough situation. Now, as an individual uh, and the organization that placed me there, I, I did come to realize that, you know, we, we did have some preconceived ideas about how to solve this problem of tenure security. Uh, and so while we had participation of those that were affected, uh, you know, in hindsight, I think it's fair to say that perhaps there was an opportunity for, for a better process of engagement. Our understanding was perhaps not as in-depth as it should have been or could have been, and um, that we maybe didn't take enough time to really collaboratively think through and build a more systems and integrated understanding of what, what the challenges really were and, and really how to try and resolve some of those challenges. Now, fast forward, lots of effort and lots of work by, by many people, and we actually managed to secure this 99-year title deed for a, for a, a 47,000 hectare village, a formal village of 47,000 47, hectares for this group. And that's this L-shaped village you see here. So there was a, a hunting and gathering village then, a village for the pastoralists, and, and, a, and a formal village for the agriculturalists to try and deal with this, these tenure security issues. Now, uh, as part of this requirement, though, of course, was that for this title deed, it required a formalized local government with specific roles and responsibilities uh, and, and very clear decision-making processes. So now you might be thinking, okay, hang on, what's, what's the problem here? Well, you know, for a nomadic hunting and, and gathering group with very little interest in maintaining possessions uh, because they're nomadic and they move around a lot, uh, and even less interest in the hierarchy of a, of a colonial-based government system, you know, this proved fundamentally problematic. Uh, and uh, ultimately, many of those local positions of, of, of decision-making in the village were taken over by agriculturalists and pastoralists, uh, who are much more familiar and comfortable in that kind of decision-making context. And so the territory didn't disappear, but the intent of the land base governed for and by this hunting and gathering group, of course, was, was undermined in many ways. And so one, it leaves one uh, perhaps feeling less than, than great about how one participated in a process like that and because we went in with some preconceived notions. Now, that was a long time ago, and, and nothing ever really stays the same. 
Um, but I think there are some initial lessons here for knowledge co-production. And, and one is the importance of humility. Uh, and more specifically, that most situations that we're actually grappling with exhibit these linked social and ecological system challenges and complexities. Uh, and to address this complexity, you know, we need, really need to be thinking about and drawing on a diversity of ideas and values and perceptions and understandings of, that emerge from different knowledge systems and that really inform how we can make decisions and how we can govern these complex, complex situations. So if we don't do this, you know, unintended and undesirable consequences and outcomes uh, might be the result. And of course, this is what Eddie and others have been talking about as well in terms of thinking about outcomes and equity and so on. So let's uh, start unpacking these concepts a little bit more. So uh, these ideas of governance and knowledge and really what they mean. So the evidence of governance challenges confronting our oceans and coasts are, are pretty significant, uh, they're pretty profound. This week has been very instructive. Right? We, uh, it's been very enlightening. And it's also been rather anxiety provoking, right? We, we're hearing lots of stories of, of things about you know, ocean warming, and ocean acidification, uh, fisheries, range shifts, and, and, and changes and things like that. But of course, these aren't just necessarily physical or ecological challenges. Uh, at the same time, we've been and also exposed to lots of information, ideas about intensity of resource use, resource use that's taking place in many different contexts, the resource conflicts that are going on, intensive economic development and so on. And that's what these pictures show. This is from a, a context in Vietnam where I've worked that really just highlights the intensity of resource use in one lagoon system uh, and all that that entails. But of course, these don't reflect uniquely social problems either. Again, they're linked social and ecological problems or challenges, and, and that's what Eric was, was referring to as well, and having to think through these connections across different scales. So this social and ecological system view really has some, some implications for how we can try and govern our future oceans and coasts, and, and we want to think through those. So for example, you know, we need to recognize that uh, the various forms of uncertainty, that may be epistemic uncertainty or linguistic uncertainty, uh, that emerges with these incremental and rapid and often unexpected changes and cross-scale effects. Well, what does that mean for our, our efforts to try and collaborate together and make decisions? It's, it's of course, very challenging. Uh, we need, in the context of these uh, types of drivers of change that are taking place, to recognize the, the inadequacy and some of the limits of our more linear and cause and effect kind of thinking, uh, and how this does challenge assumptions about certainty, scientific certainty, the role of experts in being able to understand the complexity of these systems as well, and as the primary source of knowledge. We need to, and the Tanzania example it provides a nice insight onto that, some cause and effect thinking that had some undesirable and unintended consequences as a result. Uh, we need to recognize the limits of our efforts to optimize the, the benefits of uh, the systems that we're, we're working in, in which there's little margin for error in our decisions, uh, and which really fail to take an ecosystem perspective in many respects. And we also, of course, and importantly, we need to recognize the limits of many of our responses to these challenges still, which, which you know, are often still uh, scale insensitive, um, fragmented, compartmentalized, and most importantly, they remind us that there's no one actor or agent that's really going to have all the information necessary to help us deal with this complexity and, the, and these challenges that we're confronting. So all these issues point, point to, the, to the challenges and of, of governance of our future oceans and coasts. Okay, so hang on here. I've uh, mentioned this idea of governance a few times. So what is governance anyway? Uh, and, and what forms or ingredients of governance will help us respond to these realities? And now perhaps many of you in the audience are thinking, oh boy, governance, that's, you know, that's about as exciting as watching paint dry. Oh boy. Uh, you know, and I'm not going to do myself any favors here because I'm going to give you a really dry academic definition. So governance is the system of formal and informal rules and rule-making systems. No, it's actually exciting. It's fascinating. It's great stuff. I mean, governance is about all these crazy things that we do. We talked about regulation and compliance and stuff like that. How do we develop those? It's about the rule-making systems we have to create those. It's about all these actor networks that we, we are part of and, and that study and, that, and we want to understand more about that exist at all levels of human society that are set up to steer us to help us prevent and mitigate and hopefully adapt to global and local changes, including those in our, in our oceans and coasts. Now, uh, so I find that a useful definition. It provides a lot of insight for us. But I would just add that in the face of the changes taking place and the evidence that we've been given this week and in many, many different talks, that governance is as much about deliberately transforming what are increasingly untenable situations um, 
and that recognizing some of them are incremental approaches may not be always enough. And so we really need to think about how do we get ourselves moving forward in some, some new and innovative ways. And so that's really the basis of some of the questions that colleagues and I have been examining, including most recently in a, in a synthesis of cases from, from different parts in the world. And we really asked a, a pr pr pretty straightforward question. Well, what are some of the governance ingredients, you know, the rules, the actor networks, and the processes that really enable more transformative change? What, what are some of those, and, and where do we see those in action? Now, our entry point into this, uh, into this type of analysis is very bottom-up. It's very community-based, and that's going to have some limitations. Uh, we understand that. I'm not coming at this from a, a sort of a global political regime kind of perspective. But still, the lessons, I think, resonate across geographies. They resonate across scales to a certain extent. And they really are the context for how we might grapple with some of those trade-offs that Ingrid was talking about as well. And this is the place where those messy things uh, start to take place. So what do we find in these cases? Well, very, very briefly, uh, you know, in terms of the governance ingredients that, that emerged uh, and that enable more fundamental and transformative change, well, a, a few things. The ability to design flexible and adaptive institutions and rules uh, are, is really crucial. And so that as an example, there's a case from Mexico where fishers and, and tourism operators, and that's uh, sectors that are often in conflict with each other, um, able to came together and find ways to ensure spatial access rights for, for each other, to protect livelihoods, and to build a, a rights-based co-management fishery. Uh, and, uh, and they did this in response to some very significant drivers of economic development and change that were taking place, largely in the context of tourism, but also significant stock changes that were also taking place because of environment, other environmental drivers and change. We see in lots of different cases, or we saw in lots of different cases, all sorts of examples of leadership and capacity building that were crucial in helping transform some of those governance arrangements. We saw governance arrangements uh, that really reflected these collaborative networks as being crucial in which people are connected vertically and horizontally uh, and, and are sharing information, sharing resources, and so on. And this was actually a case from the Solomon Islands, um, which really there's an interesting development and emergence of the community-based resource management process there, and perhaps that has something to do with the, with the, the greater sense of overall well-being. This is a really innovative uh, outcome. Opportunities for and, and emphasis on, on learning and, and social learning in particular. That's the kind of the learning we do that's... Um, it beyond, goes beyond the individual and becomes embedded in a social context. Well, you know, we saw an example of that from the Oliphant Estuary in South Africa, where there's this process of social learning, which really helped uh, local coastal communities um, exert their rights to, to some of the resources, engage more effectively in some of the de decision-making processes. But time and again, we, we came across this, also this idea of knowledge and knowledge co-production as being a really crucial ingredient in helping enable and foster and catalyze some of these governance transformations and, and better outcomes. And so I'm going to unpack knowledge co-production a little bit, but also highlight in doing so some of the assumptions and the limitations and how it connects with decision making and governance in that process. Okay, so where to start? Um, well, for me, I think a, a little bit of theory, a little bit of definition, and a little bit of assumptions is not a bad place or a, not a bad entry point. And knowledge co-production actually has some, some very different theoretical roots. Uh, but I'm just going to focus on a couple. Now, knowledge co-production really has a strong foundation in science and technology studies. And, and it's in this context, it takes a very critical perspective uh, on this idea of knowledge co-production. Uh, and the crucial lesson from science and technology studies uh, is that it's really difficult to separate our science from society. Right? Uh, and so that the choices we make about what questions to ask, how to study them, um, those things are driven by politics, they're driven by our values, they're driven by our relations, uh, and those relationships often reflect uh, power differentials. And as I said at the outset, and, and I think we're obligated to engage in some way with, with some of these questions and reflections if we're gonna try and affect change. And, and as a research community, I think we do wanna have an impact and, and, and reflect and affect some of that change. So that's a really crucial foundation for thinking through knowledge co-production. Now, in, in, in the body of literature that we might call sustainability science, knowledge co-production has taken on a much more normative and action-oriented kind of framing. Uh, so here, sustainability is something we create, right? So we as researchers engage with stakeholders to define questions, to collect some data, to analyze that data, and to think about how we can help affect change and create some solutions for some of these complex situations. And that's really the framing from which my own definition of knowledge co-production has emerged. 
And that's, it's this idea of a collaborative process that brings a plurality of knowledge sources and types together to address some sort of defined problem and to build this integrated and systems-oriented understanding of that problem so that we can uh, achieve some sort of better outcome. Now, I think that's, I suspect, I may be wrong, but I suspect that's the approach, that's the framing for, for most of us in, in, in this context at this conference. But we can't forget to be critical uh, about some of our underlying assumptions when we take this normative action-oriented kind of framing uh, and, and our own positionality. I mean, who, are, who are we as researchers? What role do we play in these processes of, of, of research and, and affecting change? So I thought it's worthwhile to reflect on a few assumptions that are associated with knowledge co-production uh, and I'll highlight, I'll highlight a few that I, or three that I think are kind of important. And the first actually is relatively straightforward. Uh, and it's been the focus of a number of different sessions here in, in, in some different ways. But the first is relative, is about how science is linked to policy uh, or any intervention uh, of change for that matter. And specifically, I think the idea here, and, and I'm sure this came up in, in many different contexts, is we need to move away from this pipeline or loading dock kind of model. The assumption that we produce good science and deliver it to a willing audience uh, and set of decision makers or partners. The evidence for that is not good. It's not strong at all. That's simply not the case. And so, in fact, it's rare that any scientific publication, you know, if it makes it past the paywall, and that's another issue that, that we probably have to grapple with, will be consumed by a policymaker, or let alone a community partner. Uh, and so we really need to replace that, that pipeline metaphor with a, with a minimum some sort of web of relations or, or network kind of me metaphor in which knowledge holders, knowledge users are engaged, uh, you know, through bridges and bonding processes across different scales, uh, to really try and affect change and, and use that knowledge. It's these networks that matter. And actually, that's what that figure here is. This is a network diagram from the Coral Triangle Initiative. Former PhD student of mine, Samantha Burday, you know, mapped out these knowledge exchange networks in the context of that Coral Triangle Initiative, you know, looking at different actors at different scales and how they, how they connected with one another. Um, so that's the first assumption. The second one, the second assumption re really relates to how we understand complexity. Now, this is very good. I mentioned humility. Right? We think things were wrong. Yeah, we move on. We try again. That's, for me, that's, that's really complexity in, in a nutshell. Now, specifically, in thinking about complexity, this idea of scientific knowledge really has been the dominant and universally accepted knowledge system. Now, we assume that this particular way of knowing the world is a logic, logical starting point for dealing with complexity. Uh, but I would say let's not constrain ourselves necessarily scientific knowledge and, and the scientific method are absolutely crucial. But it's also often produced outside of the local context, outside of the places where, where people are engaging with their resources and, and live their lives and things like that. And so we really need to be thinking a bit more broadly about knowledge. And Samia made, made reference to this as well in her talk. So we need to be open, I think, and uh, much more so to local knowledge, uh, and that's uh, the knowledge of particular groups, specific groups, say fishers in a bay, who have a great deal of information about their ecosystems, about ecosystem change, about what that means to them and why it matters. Uh, and a great example here is from the Friends of Port Mattoon Bay in, in Nova Scotia, where fishers really have a detailed understanding of the bay and what's been happening with their lobster fishery. They partnered with some, some oceanographers and scientists and did some really amazing uh, analyses and studies that were published in peer-reviewed papers. But it was the local knowledge of those fishers that was driving the, the research questions and information. And they used that knowledge to try and affect policy change around aquaculture in that province in Canada. We also need to be much more open to indigenous or traditional knowledge. And, and that's the, the cumulative body of knowledge and practice and, and belief systems. This is complex of knowledge, practices, and beliefs about relationships between people and each other and their, and their environments. Uh, and these things are really crucial. And I think we mostly know this, and I think we're, we're much more open to this generally, but we have to be careful with our language when we're dealing with different knowledge systems. You know, the task is not to integrate knowledge necessarily. That, that's not always possible. Uh, and the task is definitely not to validate local knowledge or traditional knowledge against the benchmark of scientific knowledge in some way. Really, it's about trying to co-produce a, a systems-based and a values-based understanding of some of these governance challenges and what we can try and do about them. And then the third assumption uh, that we need to be thinking on is our own, uh, where we sit, our own objectivity and our own positionality. So knowledge co-production absolutely is a methodological challenge, right? Researchers and stakeholders coming together, 
collaboratively asking questions, analyzing information, you know, thinking through the data, trying to figure out what it all means. But it's just as much a political project in many respects, whether we're comfortable with that or not. Uh, and so, you know, who is involved in the research process is going to affect what science is being done. It's going to determine uh, what questions we ask in the first place. It's going to influence who gets to do the asking. Uh, and it's going to influence who gets to decide what matters and what doesn't ultimately. And so I think we want to reflect on, on our positionality in that context and what role we play in these types of processes. So if we're going to grapple with our oceans and coasts, the approach we take to ask and to answer some of these questions, we really need a diversity of people. We need a diversity of epistemologies or our ways of knowing. And so I think it's really helpful to think through um, this idea of, of different people and different epistemologies as, and different ways of knowing as multiple lines of evidence to help us deal with complexity. And this is a, a really nice idea and a, and a paper that was published by Maria Tango and, and colleagues uh, on this very notion. And a great, and this, this stuff is happening. And so a great example of this, and there's a number of folks here from the Sustainable Seas Challenge from New Zealand. This is a large scale project um, that's, that's really trying to address these things, you know, the principles of knowledge co-production, a lot of efforts going into to building those relationships with lots of different community partners and stakeholders so that they can try and uh, ask and answer questions that are meaningful and relevant to the people that are involved. And it's a huge amount of work. Okay, so enough with the theory and the assumptions and stuff. You're thinking, okay, well, show me the evidence. What's going on here? Does this stuff actually work? Well, it does, in fact. There's lots of evidence for, uh, for the benefits and, and outcomes related to knowledge co-production. Uh, and that comes from the health sector, where knowledge co-production has emerged as a key idea. It comes from public service delivery. But I'm going to share a couple examples from different scales uh, and different places that, that do reflect these issues of diversity and complexity in knowledge and decision making. So, and so, so a couple lessons from the field. All right, so the first one's going to take us up to, to the Arctic, and, and Canada's Arctic specifically, where we have some innovative co-management processes that have been developed, and partly because there's been a lot of emphasis on this idea of knowledge, right? Bringing scientific knowledge together with traditional knowledge uh, and, uh, and doing so to try and address a range of, of uh, marine mammal uh, wildlife and wildlife management challenges. Now, a specific case where we can see this direct link between knowledge co-production and, and governance outcomes involves the case of, of the Husky Lakes beluga entrapments. And this was part of a project where we examined several cases, and this particular one focusing on beluga was led by a, a master's student at the time, Eric Kocher Schellenberg. Now, the specifics for the beluga entrapment uh, are less important than actually how it was addressed. But the fundamental problem here is that pods of beluga uh, can end up occasionally moving to this bay and then they get into these lakes and then they get trapped during freeze up uh, and uh, in what are relatively small open water areas where they need to surface and breathe and so on. So the issue was always, well, how do we deal with this? You know, do we hunt them because they're kind of like easy pickings? Do we try and rescue them? Do you just let them suffocate? So it becomes a source of conflict and lots of different values and perspectives get thrown into the mix. So what's interesting about this case though, is we actually can see the emergence of knowledge co-production through time and link it to governance outcomes. Uh, and so for example, way back in 1966, the parties that were directly involved uh, in one of these uh, the discovery of, of a blue entrapment were a government agency, a very colonial based government agency, Indian and Northern Affairs Canada, and a local service club that was representative of uh, non-Indigenous individuals who were living in, in a small community in the, in the north. And, um, and this is a really crude sort of network diagram depicting very basic relationships about who was involved uh, in making decisions about this beluga entrapment. And so according to Indigenous people whose territory this was taking place in, uh, who hunt uh, and are on the land all the time, you know, there was no exchange uh, of knowledge or experience with them about what to do about, uh, with this situation. Uh, and so rather than seeking to understand uh, the situation or learn from local hunters, the service club and the government agency attempted to rescue and, and feed the beluga with limited success. Now fast forward again, uh, and there were back-to-back -back entrapments in 2006 and 2007. Uh, however, by 2006 and 2007, the indigenous people uh, of this part of Canada had much more control over the management process. Yeah, and they were doing so in collaboration with Fisheries and Oceans Canada and other partners, but they were really, really relying on their own experiences, their own practices, their own knowledge. Uh, and uh, were beginning to take proactive measures about what to do in the future entrapments as they started to emerge. And so at this point, the knowledge and decision-making networks were much more dense. They were really being driven by indigenous people, uh, again, in partnership with many others. But the point was 
all that, that process, the knowledge exchange and co-production process had become much more embedded. So the question is, well, what happened? Well, in 1984, the Indigenous group signed what's called a Comprehensive Land Claim Agreement with the federal government. And that's really provided a legal foundation for co-management and clear stipulations about the importance of using traditional knowledge to help in decision-making processes. Uh, and so things were slowly improving. And by 2006 and 2007, 22 years after the signing of the agreement, the co-management institutions were much more established, uh, knowledge sharing networks were much more established, um, communication processes were, were, were generally more effective. You know, are things perfect? Are they ideal? Of course not. Lots of conflicts and challenges still, but a fundamentally different set of conditions and circumstances existed between 1966 and 2006 and 2007. Now, there are a couple of lessons here uh, when thinking about knowledge co-production as we move forward. And the first, of course, is that it takes a heck of a long time. Uh, and, uh, you know, we're looking at in the order of a decade or more and two decades for some of these things to coalesce. And the second thing when we're thinking about knowledge co-production and valuing knowledge systems is that they may be more effective when they're institutionalized, when there's an institutional foundation or legal requirement uh, for us to think about knowledge much more systematically and to value different knowledge systems in very clear and direct ways. And it gets to this issue of equity. So a second example uh, that I want to touch on uh, is something called the Ocean Modeling Forum, and, and, and Zach mentioned this as well. It's a little bit different. Uh, and takes us into a, some, some different realms. And I think one of the lessons here as well is that knowledge co-production takes place in lots of different forms. It's not one sort of recipe. There's lots of different ways it can be, be configured. So this Ocean Modeling Forum, it's a group formed to help managers, scientists, and the ocean community uh, to address complex issues. And that's, of course, why we're all here. Uh, and now there are several working groups in the Ocean Modeling Forum, one of which is the Pacific Herring Working Group, and that's the one that I've been involved in. Now, the Pacific herring uh, fishery, like lots of other fisheries, is, is complex. Herring stocks have exhibited dramatic declines and very slow recovery. Uh, and as a result, there have been you know, significant conflicts over rights to the fish for commercial, but also for cultural objectives, very important for the well-being of Pacific First Nations. And those conflicts and stock declines have led to a lack of trust in the governance process. Uh, and uh, in, in the Canadian context, uh, occupations of the fisheries and oceans, uh, uh, office at one point, uh, lawsuits in Alaska. Uh, and so, you know, again, it's a pretty, a pretty challenging context. And so it's in this setting that the OMF was formed to kind of reflect collectively on, well, how can we manage herring for multiple objectives, the triple bottom line idea that was mentioned, and how can traditional knowledge be incorporated into some of these quantitative models that are really used to make decisions about herring and about herring stocks? Okay, now, the core feature of, of the Ocean Modeling Forum are these working groups, uh, and they're really intended to foster that co-production idea, uh, and that is bringing a plurality of, of different types and sources together to build these systems-oriented understandings of what's happening in a particular issue or in a particular challenge. So, for, the, for example, the, the membership of the Pacific Herring Working Group uh, consists of the actual resource managers and fisheries, uh, government fisheries scientists that are involved in making those decisions. Uh, Indigenous and First Nations representatives, some industry stakeholders, uh, social scientists like myself, natural scientists, and of course, modelers. And so we all have some very different backgrounds. Uh, and it's really in this context that the OMF is leading to some, some interesting and, and some new outputs that have been co-produced and we're thinking about some things in, in some, some different ways, which has been really a lot of fun. It's been, been very thought-provoking as well. And I'll, I want to elaborate just a little bit more on, on, on an example from this. Now, a lot of decisions about fisheries, for example, really depend on these quantitative models uh, to evaluate alternative management strategies or harvest strategies and, and different options. These models are, of course, very useful uh, for dealing with complexity, but they do often reflect a particular way of knowing the world and thinking about the world. Uh, and insights from diverse epistemologies, as I, as I mentioned previously, are not easily included, uh, and, and nor are some of the broader political and governance uh, issues that frame the questions that these models are, are, are trying to, to ask and answer. Uh, and so uh, I want to give you an example of that in the context of this group. So there's been growing support for, for this hypothesis that, that the migratory paths of, of, of fishes may be the result of learned behavior. It's this go with the old fish versus a random diffusion model. Now, why does this matter? Well, I didn't know this about a year ago. I do now. Uh, if herring migration isn't random, uh, 
this may help explain why herring have been actually missing from lots of beaches and, and previous spawning sites, even in cases where the numbers overall might appear to be adequate. So if the older fish uh, that spawned at a specific beach are being taken out of the system, uh, then there are no fish left uh, to take the next generation back to those particular sites. And, and this is really what it tells us is we have to focus on much finer space, spatial scales when we're dealing with the management challenges of, of herring and trying to rebuild herring stock. Now, I find that super cool. You know, as a social scientist, what do I know about learned behavior of fish? Virtually nothing. Uh, but this is where, in my mind, it gets really cool. Uh, so there's an independent line of, of evidence. Again, think about that multiple uh, bases, multiple lines of evidence to help us understand complexity. An independent line of evidence for learned migration uh, is provided by indigenous knowledge holders in this area. And this is actually a conversation that came about when uh, two Ocean Modeling Forum members uh, got together. Um, and Harvey Kitka, who's a longtime fisherman uh, and tribal elder from Sitka, Alaska, was chatting with Alec McCall, who's a longtime fisheries researcher and has worked with herring for, for, you know, for a couple decades. They realized that the patterns that they had both observed over the years shared a number of commonalities. And then other members of our working group uh, have also highlighted similar observations. Uh, in indigenous oral traditions in southeast Alaska and British Columbia. And so have, and they've actually documented the convergence of local and traditional knowledge really about the importance of mature fish leading first time spawners to spawning grounds. So this congruence of knowledge types and sources is really striking. It became the foundation for this co-production of, of insights and questions and analysis about Pacific herring uh, that probably wouldn't otherwise have, have taken place. And again, it has some real implications for how that the herring might be managed by the, the, by the management authorities that are also involved in, in the Ocean Modeling Forum. So again, there's some important lessons here from, from this story. And specifically, that the process of understanding complexity may be as much relational uh, as it is a technical exercise. Right? And that's really reflected in the fact that those interactions between Ocean Modeling Forum members uh, really fostered and catalyzed some of these insights and, and drove some of this analysis. And in fact, that relationship is continuing uh, because the uh, Ocean Modeling Forum is, is now participating in a, in a herring rebuilding strategy in Haida Gwaii in, in the Pacific Northwest of Canada with the Haida Nation, with the federal government and, and other partners as well. So some, some neat things that, that emerge from that. Okay, so time, time is getting short. Um, so I want to get to, to the last few points. So we've unpacked some ideas of knowledge co-production and governance and why they, they are connected and why they matter, including some key assumptions about complexity and the importance of diversity. And I've provided a couple examples where we see these things taking place and, and leading to some, some better outcomes and being connected to governance. But for many of us in this room, I think there are going to be some real challenges with how we think about knowledge co-production. And we can call these challenges or, or we can call them some necessary frictions to be thinking about. And some of these are going to be structural, some of them are going to be a bit more personal, some of them are about incentives. But the idea is that the, the theory uh, of knowledge co-production looks good on the outside, but we flip it inside out, it gets a little bit fuzzy, you know, maybe there's a few things we've got to think through a little bit more carefully. Um, uh, and to, to remind ourselves not to idealize this, this concept either. Uh, okay, and so I thought I would highlight just a few of these things that, that uh, I think we, we need to work through. Uh, so the first is that somehow knowledge co-production and the emphasis on it might be a threat to fundamental science or, or some sort of repudiation of that. That's not at all the case. Again, knowledge co-production is not a panacea, uh, but it is w one way of doing things, and it's particularly helpful when we're trying to grapple with social and ecological complexity uh, and that's happening at, at different scales and where we're trying to affect change. So it's valuable in that context, but it's not a, a threat in any way to, to different forms uh, and ways of knowing and, and threats to fundamental science. Now, in related to that, there is a view that maybe it's not safe for early career researchers, and if there's a number of early career researchers in the room, maybe you're grappling with this question right now, that is not safe because you're spanning boundaries, and in doing that, maybe you're undermining your disciplinary legitimacy of some kind, or you're falling into some sort of interdisciplinary trap. I personally don't really buy into that view. I mean, I'm, I'm in a very interdisciplinary and, and problem-oriented uh, uh, program, and our graduates are finding success inside and outside academia. And in fact, Rachel Kelly, who's here, has, has been leading a paper 
really that grapples with a lot of these issues on, on sort of the tips for developing a next generation of, of interdisciplinary researchers and really helps us think through some of these constraints and challenges. But again, I think there's a lot of merit in, in being exposed to, to ideas about knowledge co-production regardless of where we're coming from and what our framing is. Now, having said that, there's no question, it takes a lot of time to build relationships, clearly. Uh, and it takes a lot of time to build the trust necessary for effective knowledge co-production. And that means it's gonna take a lot of money. Uh, and so funders are gonna require uh, and encourage these ideas of knowledge co-production and transdisciplinarity and, and much more focus on science policy linkages and so on. Well, then they're gonna also have to pay for it. And, and in particular, we need more to support early career researchers so that you and, the, and uh, can meaningfully engage in, in knowledge co-production processes. Again, the Arctic example I shared uh, you know, took place outside of a defined research project, but we're talking you know, on the order of a decade or more for some of these things to coalesce. And so we really need to be uh, open-minded and, and aware of what you know, these trust building and relationship building processes which at the core of knowledge co-production are all about. There's also, I think, capacity and fatigue issues we need to work through for researchers, for sure, but more so for perhaps the, the re our research partners. Lots of communities are saturated. Uh, lots of uh, places are saturated. And so more researchers with more questions, you know, may not always be the answer. Uh, and so maybe we need to spend more time thinking about those longer-term relationships uh, and, and, be, and, you know, the extent to which we can serve as, as sort of knowledge brokers and serve as allies and link partners with different uh, experts and expertise and sources of, of funding and things like that. The science still gets done, but it gets done in some, some different ways. Again, there's no one model for this type of thing. Uh, now, our incentive structures uh, are still not really well aligned for this, at least in academia, and, or at least in many parts of academia, uh, despite its growing relevance. Um, that is changing, but it is a little bit slow. I'm sure all of us have some uh, ideas and stories around that. Uh, my colleague, Ryan Plummer, at his institution at Brock University in Canada, is actually leading, leading an initiative to try and come up with different measures, different metrics for, for measuring success. So, you know, the idea of the currency of papers as being the ultimate measure, well, it's still valuable, still important, but maybe it's, it's less of a useful metric moving forward, depending on what we're trying to accomplish. And so things like, to what extent we share resources, to what extent we build capacity with partners and, and, uh, uh, and communities and so on, maybe those are the kind of metrics that we need to be focusing more on. Uh, so that requires us to think through things a little bit more. I'm sure there are other challenges and frictions, but that's probably more than enough, uh, you know, in, in one, one day. So where do we go from here? What, uh, what can we do with this? Well, I think, in my mind, there's a chance to perhaps co-produce a little bit of a... So I started off with a bit of a failure story, and I, I did that for a reason, obviously to, to share the idea that what happens when we go in with preconceived ideas and, and, uh, and perhaps don't spend as much time building that collaborative uh, and systems-oriented understanding of particular problems. So I think now there's actually a chance for us to perhaps co-produce a new story or perhaps a new narrative for how we as a research community may want to, to continue to affect change. You know, it's been mentioned several times. Inbury really is a, 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 a unique platform. It's connecting people from local to global scales, um, natural and social sciences. We're missing, I think, the humanities still in this context. Um, but it is certainly getting more diverse. It's, it's creating opportunities for, for new partnerships and, and really a much more integrated approach uh, in how we deal with our oceans and coasts and our, our future oceans and coasts, obviously, uh, which is really exciting. And so the, the science Inber agenda is quite impressive. It, it's, it's fantastic. And it gives us an opportunity to further push forward and, and move forward on these ideas of knowledge co-production uh, and allied concepts that we're using here this week. And, you know, we talk about participation. We talk about people. We talk about policy and governance. I think there's still room to talk about further what it means to affect change and how we actually do that, how we operationalize some of our, our efforts to achieve uh, these grand challenges. I mean, so can Ember be even more of a leading model and context uh, for the type of applied research we need to grapple with the complexity of our future oceans? Uh, you know, if we don't drive this agenda, is there a better context for it? You know, I think there's a lot of merit in, in what we can bring as a, as a, as a science and research community to, to these challenges. So I guess I'll end, and, and I should end, yep, uh, with a, a final point. Um, I think ultimately to do so, we do need to, to really recognize the importance of, of this relational view of knowledge co-production of our own research. 
Uh, we need to further emphasize the sets of relationships that reflect a diversity of people, a diversity of epistemologies, uh, of ways of knowing that, that are poised to grapple with the types of complexity that we're, we're dealing with, and that really build these collaborative networks that link diverse actors across scales. So I'm going to leave it there. Uh, uh, thank you very much. I hope in the next five or ten years we'll have somewhat of a, a new story to tell, and, and hopefully it continues to be a really uh, effective story and a positive story about how we can promote positive change in our ocean. So thanks very much. Uh, yeah. Thanks, Derek, for it's over here, Marion, <laughs> for a stimulating talk. And uh, one question here, here. <laughs> uh, one question I would have you talked about linking knowledge systems and uh, uh, knowledge types, uh, various uh, times. And I noted you had two types of knowledge there represented the scientific knowledge, and then one kind local knowledge, and another kind traditional knowledge. And my question would be, where and how is the knowledge of government at its various levels, the kind of government that has all sorts of different faces from very collaborative and very positioned and relevant to probably also hostile and uh, very differently positioned. But we somehow need to grapple with that as well to become more complex, yeah, uh, I, I, appropriately I, I, complex. Yes, yeah. We need more complexity, absolutely. Yeah. No. Uh, I, I fully agree with you, of course. I'm just sort of highlighting a few knowledge systems and ways of knowing uh, that uh, maybe resonate uh, a little bit more directly. But you know, policy knowledge, uh, knowledge of government officials and different stakeholders in that context, industrial and industry partners and their knowledge base. Of course, these all are different knowledge types, knowledge systems that, that um, are going to bring perspectives that, that have to be grappled with. And so in the knowledge co-production process, really it's all about who you have around that, in that process, in that context. And so I wasn't trying to limit it to those three knowledge systems, but just use those as, as some examples. And in the Ocean Modeling Forum, we do have industry, we have First Nations representatives, we have those government folks as well in that context. So but it's, it's a great point. Can I, can I ask? Uh, thank you so much, Derek. Uh, this is Ratana. Um, I, I really like uh, you know, how you opened the talk about calling attention to the role and responsibility of research community. And I think that really reminds us that sometimes we, are, we tend to be perhaps overconfident in our you know, scientific knowledge, in our models, you know, and including oversimplification of the world. I mean, that's uh, the comments from our colleague here, Aluso, about, you know, social scientists in the room would be wondering, you know, you can't ask just one question or even a few questions to really un understand what's going on. But I think one of the things that you really pointed out and you call attention to the concept of governance. So, and, and people use that term a lot in this conference, the same thing as we talk about transdisciplinarity. But to focus on the governance and to hear that the majority, the emphasis, yeah, the emphasis of many and many of the presentations and the discussion that we have been having this week is really about management. It's really talking about how to be more effective in our management, how to better regulate, more and more and more regulation. So I want to hear what you would say to, to us uh, you know, with respect to how to really shift and change our thinking about this to make it more along, line, along the line of what you're talking about. Thank you. Okay, thanks. That's, that's, a, that's a great question or point and a challenging one also. I, I think just quickly, I know we're running out of time, but very briefly a quick story from the Ocean Modeling Forum. You know, the first time we met, we were using terms management and governance, and it took us a, probably about a day, if not two days, to really realize we actually, because people like myself and the modelers and the others, we're not talking about the same thing at all, even though we're using the same term. And so we have this, this challenge of language and, and our definitions, and that came up in one of our sessions yesterday. Uh, you know, the, the overuse of definitions versus the underuse of definitions and so on. You know, I mean, for me, management is about making operational decisions on the ground, as you kind of alluded to. Governance is really about the principles, the values, the, 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 the higher level, or what you would refer to, I think, the sort of the meta-governance principles that really drive how we as societies come together ultimately to make some decisions about things that matter to us. 
uh, and uh, uh, it's really, I kind of alluded to this notion of, of steering societies as well, and that brings in all sorts of, of, uh, of ideas about, well, who's doing the steering and what's driving that and whose knowledge is involved in that. So it's a higher level sets of principles and challenges and, and values that, that really, for me, frames what matters most about, about governance and being taking a very critical view and drawing on critical social understandings to uh, deal with and, and recognize the complexity of that is really crucial. So it's a very brief answer to a, a complex question. All right, we should probably let people get some coffee now. Um, thank you. Uh, please join me in thanking Derek again.